This is Lisa Foster's FBI interview, first time, May of 94. She identified the, she said, I couldn't, I couldn't identify the official death gun back in July of 93. This is her first interview with the Bureau. It's done under the auspices of Mr. Fisk. Mr. Foster, Mrs. Foster's at the interview. Uh, a, a top counsel from Fisk's office is present. The Foster family attorney is present. At least two FBI guys are present. This is the type report generated from the interview. We're just going to talk about the gun portion. Now, if anybody can come up with an innocuous explanation for this, I give you permission to tell me about it when I get through with this segment because I have cudgeled my brains, as we say, and I can't. Here's, we're going to look at the interview page by page here. Lisa Foster then examined a revolver which had been brought to the interview by the interviewing agents. We got the actual gun now, no photo. She examined it. They hand it to her. This is the gun, lady. We found it with your husband. Uh, Foster, meaning Lisa, the widow, examined the revolver which had also be found at Fort Marcy Park and stated she believed it may be a gun which she formerly saw in her residence in Little Rock. All right, the silver gun. Okay, so far so good. Next one. Uh, this is the handwritten interview notes here, same interview, but it says, Lisa Foster, oh, Lisa Foster packed a silver colored gun in Little Rock, unpacked it in D.C. This is just to show that in this case, the handwritten notes do jibe with the type report. Next one. I'm going to get you a gold medal here. Okay, we're moving on. Next page of the interview. Lisa Foster believes she may have seen the gun which she examined dur previously during the interview. We just read that part. Uh, at her residence in Washington. She recalls that as she was packing her, you, you've heard all this before, specifically as Lisa Foster was packing in Little Rock, she came across a silver colored gun which she then packed. So far so good. Next one. Then she says, uh, Lisa Foster believes the gun found at Fort Marcy Park. Next one. May be the silver gun which she brought up with her other belongings when she apparently moved to Washington. Mr. Fisk told us all about this gun except one thing. He didn't tell us the ID was based on a silver gun. There's a reason for that. Uh, Lisa Foster believes that the gun may be the same revolver she was shown by the interviewing agents. Okay, next one. Okay, here's the problem. The silver colored gun that she is identifying as the official death weapon cannot be the official death weapon because the official death weapon is black. It ain't silver. So the dichotomy I'm faced with in the FBI interview is either they showed her the black official death weapon, she held it in her hand, she looked at it, and she said something really brilliant. Oh, hey, this looks like the silver gun I brought up from Little Rock. Now, guys and girls both, I think, can do, you know, what's lavender, what's puce, what's chartreuse, what's taupe. Silver and black is pretty basic. The alternative I have to the fact that Lisa Foster can't tell silver from black, which I have trouble with, is that they showed her the silver gun, the one that's never been found, the one that was missing that night, the one that was supposed to make it to the body before it was discovered. It didn't make it to the body. That's why there was no gun when the first few people got there. Then they freaked out and they said, we need a gun right now. And Frank somebody or whatever dropped his federal semi-automatic pistol down there as a placeholder. For whatever reason, the silver gun did not make it, and they couldn't go with the federal semi-automatic, so they did a drop gun. Now, Fisk knew he had this problem, and so what he did, in my opinion, I mean, assuming Lisa's not another moron, and she's, uh, uh, when did she graduate? She graduated from Sweetbriar College in Virginia. It's a ladies' college. And I think they teach, and she's into home decorating, by the way. I think she knows the difference between silver and black. I think they showed her the silver gun, and they knew to do that because they read the, the same handwritten notes you saw where she said, yeah, I can't identify this black gun. It's not the silver gun, you know, that I brought up in Little Rocks. They said, let's get her the gun, or at least let's get her a silver gun. And nine months later, she does it for him. Notice. This happened with her attorney present. This happened with independent or Fisk counsel people present. It happened in the presence of two FBI agents. Now, one of two things happened. I'll get to that in a minute. Let's go on to the next one. Okay, this is just more. This is the agent who did the death notification. No, the only real question I got to ask about the gun, did Vince own a gun? She asked me, what does it look like, you know? To me, right away, I'm thinking, ah, he, oh, yeah, he does. Well, it's a black-colored revolver, 38 revolver. The gun's black. Next one. 
We'll rattle through. Oh, yeah. Here's a picture of the silver gun. Now, there is a wee bit of gray on it, but you'll notice this is a flash picture, so this is just a little sparkle, I believe, off the flash. But even if those were there, nobody I know would say that's a silver gun. The record is replete with other photographs. The gun is entirely black. Next one. Oh, Alan Favish uh, uh, lives out here. He's done a lot of work on this case. He's a friend of mine. I met him when I came out uh, to talk to the bar, Glendale Bar, last month. Uh, I'm just going to read this because I think it's a very succinct statement in lawyerly but clear language. I could not do a better job myself, so I stole Alan's. Mr. Fisk's use of Mrs. Foster's statement, which you've seen, Fisk is using her statement to tell her the gun is a Foster family gun that she brought up from Little Rock. It all hangs together if you just read the Fisk report because he does not tell you the gun that she's identifying that she brought up from home was silver and the official death gun is black. If you don't know that difference, it all hangs together on the face of the Fisk report. Okay. If she was shown a silver gun at the FBI interview, then obviously she failed to give a valid definition of the official black gun, right? It's a bum ID. If they showed her the silver gun, we know the official death gun was black. Bum ID. Likewise, if she was shown the official black, gu black death gun at this later interview and identified it as being silver colored, then equally obviously she failed to give a valid identification. It doesn't matter which way you go. Either one was a, a, a terrible deception by Mr. Fisk. No matter what color gun Mrs. Foster was shown at the later interview, given her response, it was clearly deceptive for Mr. Fisk to use her response as if it was a valid identification of the official black death gun. Uh, bum, bum, bum. Yeah, let's skip the rest of that because we've pretty much covered that. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. Huh. We're going to talk about we've had 100% medical certainty. I'm going to give you 100% handgun certainty for real. Allen got some ground truth. He called up on the record and interviewed the Park Police investigator, the one who made the death notification, the one who was the in charge at the body site, the one who, you know, uh, was there with this official death gun. He also interviewed the evidence technician who removed the gun from Mr. Foster's hand. He interviewed him on the record earlier this year. This is so amazing. Uh, Let's see, pum, pum, pum. When interviewed on February 5, 97, Park Police officers stood by their official statement that the official death gun was black. Mr. Rolla, the lead investigator, said the gun was black. This is icing on the cake. We know it's black. When asked to explain why the FBI reported that Mrs. Foster believed the gun shown to her by the FBI was silver colored, he said, ask the FBI, ask Fisk, ask Lisa. These two guys saw for the first time when Alan gave it to them. Lisa Foster's FBI interview, the one that we just read together, and Alan said, how about a little help, guys? Can you tell me what the hell's going on here? And they went, geez, we don't know. Moving on, the evidence technician. I took the gun out of Foster's hand. The gun looked black. Asked, when asked if the gun could be described as gray or silver, he said no. Asked to explain Mrs. Foster's reported description of the gun shown to her by the FBI, he said, I don't understand that myself. So... Even the park police are mystified by what happened in an FBI interview. Next one. Uh, this is Lee Foster Bowman. This is Vince Foster's nephew. He was the gunman in his generation, the generation, one generation below Vince's. He hunted uh, with Mr. Foster and with Mr. Foster's father. He was shown the official death gun by the FBI. Now, knowing what you know now about, gee, Lisa the family probably did own a silver gun, but they didn't own a black revolver, you know, that sort of thing. This is the, the kid that knows the guns, the family guns, the best. Mr. Fisk, by the way, never mentioned this interview. Here's what Lee, the, ne the nephew, told the FBI. Bowman was then shown the 38 caliber Colt revolver believed to have been used by Vince Foster John to kill himself. Bowman was asked if he recognized this weapon. Bowman said, the gun does not ring a bell particularly. Bowman said the 38 caliber nature of the weapon was familiar. Maybe the silver gun was a 38. Uh, but he didn't remember the black handle and the dark color of the metal. Uh, he indicated he's familiar with the cylinder and barrel portion of this size or caliber weapon except for the color of the metal. What he's, the FBI is fudging this a little bit, but what he's saying is, is guess what? You know, this ain't the gun I remember because the gun I remember wasn't black. I'm familiar with another color. Guess what color? Silver. Next one.
little thing on the gun. Now, Mr. Foster is found in the park. There's a whole mishmash of screw-ups having to do with when the White House learned about this. They learned about the death several hours before they said they did. But what happened is it's pretty much undisputed. At some point, the park police watch commander, shift commander, called the Secret Service Command Center, room 058 of the White House basement. I have their phone number. I called them. They told me who they were and where they were. And he said, hey, we got Dead Foster out here. We know it's Mr. Foster because we got his Arkansas picture driver's license. We got his White House ID. We got an unmarked face. It's Mr. Foster. Trust us. And so the Secret Service put the word out internally. Hey, Deputy White House Counsel Vince Foster has been reported found dead in somewhere at Fort Marcy Park, Park Police, bum, bum, bum. Now, very shortly after that happened, Gavin, the Park Police shift commander, got two calls from the White House. Now, bear in mind my little scenario about how the gun wasn't there and the silver gun was supposed to have been there and it didn't make it there and they did the placeholder gun, the automatic, and then they used the drop gun. Now, if you were perhaps knowledgeable of this little scam and wondering, you know, you knew the plan, but you didn't know if it had succeeded, what would you do when you learned that Vince was dead if you were in the White House and you call the park police? Look at this. It's amazing. This is Patrick Gavin, the shift commander's FBI interview. Uh, here we go, this part. Mr. Burton, that's Assistant White House Chief of Staff, major Arkansas core group person, called Gavin. Mr. Burton first inquired about whether the U.S. Park Police had checked the registration on the gun that was used and asking if they knew whose gun it was. That's the first question when a guy who works in your company that you know well is found dead. Tell me the gun registration. Who owns that gun? What's the story? That's a really weird question. 